Back in 2018, my game of the year was The Messenger, a lovely retro-styled Metroidvania platformer that quickly became one of my favorite games of all time. But it didn't just appear out of thin air. No, it wore its inspiration on its sleeve. And that inspiration was none other than the iconic Ninja Gaiden on the NES. Now, the era of the NES was a bit before my time, so I hadn't ever touched Ninja Gaiden myself. That being said, I absolutely love Gaiden-inspired platformers, so I figured it was high time I played through the Ninja Gaiden series myself to see where it all began. And of course, I was very interested to see how the series grew and improved, especially considering that all three games released in only a three-year period. So please, join me as we take a look at the evolution of Ninja Gaiden. But real quickly, if at any point you think I'm doing a good job, please consider leaving a like and subscribe if you find my content interesting. It really does help me as a creator. Also, follow me on Twitter at AdsTweets and check the description for a link to my Discord server. Alright, enough of that. Before I really get started, a few caveats and disclaimers. Firstly, all three games feature pretty harsh color palettes and some levels have a lot of flashing, so if you're photosensitive, please keep that in mind. Secondly, this was all done on emulator. From what I've seen, the emulation is pretty faithful, but if there's any weirdness or inconsistencies, that's probably why. Thirdly, I'm only going to be talking about the Ninja Gaiden games on the NES, not the action RPG series from the 2000s. And lastly, there will be spoilers, though you really shouldn't be playing Ninja Gaiden for the story. Alright? Got it? Good. So to start things off, I want to talk a bit about the visuals and sounds before I really get into gameplay because it's pretty consistent throughout the entire series. It really just didn't change much over time. Visually, as you might expect, it's all pixel art. The foreground and background are visually distinct from one another, and most of the time I found it pretty easy to tell what parts of the screen were things I could interact with and what parts were just decoration, at least for the most part. The biggest negative I can think of is the limited color palette, which did lead to certain elements blending together a bit, but I can't really fault the games too much as I don't think it's emblematic of poor visual design as much as it simply being the result of technical limitations on the NES. In-game animations were good, if a little stiff at times. There are also lightly animated cutscenes that play in between acts. Honestly, I don't think they aged particularly well. As far as music goes, it's fucking amazing. Now, I like chiptune in general, but I found myself thoroughly enjoying every track in all three games, which really did a lot for the overall experience. Especially when I would get stuck on a particularly tough section. I'll have music from the series playing in the background, so if you haven't already, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so now, let's finally get into the games. The first Ninja Gaiden game starts us off with a cutscene setting up the plot. Quite simply, our protagonist, Ryu Hayabusa's father, was killed in a duel to the death. He leaves Ryu a note telling him to travel to America to find an archaeologist named Walter Smith. Furthermore, the Dragon Sword, a treasured family heirloom, now belongs to him, so he's out for revenge. Yeah, not the most original story in the world, but as I mentioned earlier, you shouldn't be playing Ninja Gaiden for the story. Throughout the entire series, the story is basically a cheesy 80s action sci-fi movie that's only really there to justify the gameplay. So when it comes to the gameplay, it's pretty standard side-scrolling platformer stuff where the goal is to simply get to the end of the stage without dying. I found the movement to be surprisingly smooth, which is an absolute godsend. I found that platformers on the NES are very hit or miss. I mean, Super Mario was great. The original Castlevania? Not so much. That being said, while Ninja Gaiden is on the upper end of NES titles, it definitely shows its age. I can't really fault the developers too much considering these games are older than I am, but as someone who's very familiar with modern platformers, I've come to appreciate how much the collection knowledge of game design has grown. An example I like to give is Coyote Time. Coyote Time is based on the old Roadrunner cartoons where Wile E. Coyote would run off a cliff and just hover in the air until he looked down. While in game design, it refers to a system where you can actually jump off a platform just a tiny bit late, usually the window is a few frames or so, though different games do it differently. The idea is they don't want to make it so you have to jump at frame perfect intervals. If you're a little early, you can still make the jump. If you're a little late, Coyote Time makes it so you won't just fall over the edge. It keeps things balanced. Well, Ninja Gaiden does not have Coyote Time. If you miss the edge by even a little, you're falling to your death. And this happened to me quite a lot. Even by the time I had finished the entire series, I was still running off the edge of platforms every so often. And again, I'm not shit-talking the developers because it simply wasn't industry standard at the time like it more or less is now. But I think it illustrates how the series is 30 years old and you're damn right it feels like it. The Coyote Time thing and a lot of other small little details all come together to give Ninja Gaiden a very retro feel. It isn't always a bad thing, however. I'm not sure how well it comes across in the video, but the running and jumping has a very snappy kind of feeling to it, to the point where your character sprite almost feels detached from the environment. 
This stiff kind of movement is not something you see in many platformers nowadays, but I don't think Ninja Gaiden is any worse off for it. In fact, I actually found a good deal of novelty to it since it's not something I'm super familiar with. And besides, the controls are generally pretty responsive and, most importantly, nothing feels sluggish. So it almost feels like a stylistic decision rather than a dated one. So as you may or may not know, Ninja Gaiden has a bit of a reputation. That reputation being that it's goddamn fucking hard, a reputation that is well earned in my opinion. But what's interesting is that the actual raw platforming is pretty simple simple, at least for the most part. The actual challenge comes mainly from the enemies. See, there are a variety of different enemy types, all of which have set movement patterns and spawn locations. You get everything from dudes who just walk back and forth aimlessly, enemies that run at you, some that can actually jump platforms which is pretty neat, and stationary enemies that fire bullets in your general direction. Each enemy type is visually distinct and their patterns are simple enough that I was never left confused or thinking, oh shit, what does this one do again? Additionally, almost every non-boss enemy can be killed in one slice of the dragon sword which makes you feel like such a badass when you can just intercept or avoid an enemy's attack before cutting them down. The difficulty of Ninja Gaiden comes from these enemy types and how they're placed throughout the levels and how they interact with the platforming. See, whenever you get hit, you lose some health and are knocked back. Sometimes it's just a mild inconvenience. That inconvenience becomes a bit less mild if you're knocked off a platform. So you have to navigate the levels and find a way to deal with all the various enemies while avoiding taking too many hits and losing all your health, but also treating them as platforming hazards themselves, where getting hit at the wrong time will spell your death. This is actually a pretty fun way to do things. Most of the platformers I really enjoy focus more on the pure platforming difficulty. I mean, one of my favorite games is Celeste, and that's almost entirely about navigating the environment rather than fighting enemies. That being said, the Ninja Gaiden design made me approach platforming in a completely different way and I found that to be fun and fulfilling. And I think it works in the game's favor how much the enemies rely on set patterns. It allows you to make a plan of action and test your knowledge on each individual enemy and how well you can adapt to these enemies in different contexts and combinations. Sometimes it was pretty simple and purely a matter of timing. Sometimes I had to plan a specific course of action to manipulate the obstacles in a specific way. I think the best example of this was with the bird enemies. The fucking birds. A variation of this enemy type exists in all three games and it's characterized by flying onto the screen and very loosely homing in on you. Generally speaking, the way to deal with this enemy is to either maneuver so that it flies off screen and despawns or get it in a position where it's coming straight at you, allowing you to kill it. The difficulty of this increases exponentially when you have to account for other enemies, dangerous platforming, and different levels of elevation which will change the angles you need to worry about. It's especially annoying when a bird spawns as you're in the middle of a jump and knocks you out of the air. I can't tell you how many deaths over the course of these three games came as a result of these fucking birds. I swear, they made me start hating birds in real life. Fuck you! Now overall, I think this high level of difficulty and interesting approach to level design are a big positive, but I have to acknowledge that Ninja Gaiden is definitely held back a bit by some of the more archaic elements of its mechanics. A few examples. You have much less in-air mobility when you're jumping backwards than forwards. That means you have to actually turn your character before jumping if you want to make certain jumps, and this is a problem when split-second timing or twitch reactions are needed. When you cling to a wall, which happens automatically, there's no way to just drop down. You have to jump off. If there are enemies around, there's a good chance you're taking a hit because you can't climb up or down either unless you're on a ladder. Your attack doesn't actually register until the end of the animation, requiring you to adapt to the weird timing. None of these things make the game not fun. I still thoroughly enjoyed my time with Ninja Gaiden, but whenever I would have to adjust to something that wasn't quite as smooth as I'm used to, it made me think that this game, as good as it is, could have been so much better if only the developers had the experience and resources they would have today. You could keep the overarching level design and just iron out some of the mechanical kinks, and I feel like that alone would have done wonders for the final product. Again, I really can't fault the developers, but it's a shame that Ninja Gaiden is just not quite there. So now I kinda wanna pivot back a bit into level design. As I said before, the majority of the challenge in the main body of each stage is enemy placement. While there are also little orbs or lanterns or whatever skin they decide to use that float around and are scattered throughout the stage. Slice these things and they'll drop a pickup. Sometimes it's something as simple as bonus points. Sometimes they'll give you energy you need to use your secondary weapon. Sometimes it'll switch up your secondary weapon. And rarely, you might get a bonus life. The thing is, the orbs always contain the same items every time, but you won't know what it is until you make it drop said pickup. Now, there are many instances where having a specific secondary weapon will make that section significantly easier. If there are going to be a lot of enemies spawning above you, having the flame that shoots upward diagonally is amazing. If you need to jump to a tiny platform with an enemy on it, having the shuriken is perfect. Certain platforming sections seem tailor-made to work with the weapon that essentially gives you a Metroid-style screw attack. 
While this is pretty neat, it means that there are things you can't really prepare for until you've played around with a section. And I don't just mean experimentation in different approaches, I mean methodically slicing every lantern to see what they all hold. But should you even take the time? If a particular section isn't too bad to get through, it may not be worth checking every little thing. This feeds into something I feel is a bit of an issue with how the game is on a structural and design level. It feels like you have to know the ins and outs of the game, or at least the later stages, to have a really fun, immersive experience. This is also evident in the enemy placement that makes up almost the entire challenge of the game. Due to the way the game is built, you'll sometimes have enemies that you don't see until you've already committed to a jump. A lot of times I feel like you kind of have to know what's coming to properly navigate the game. And to be clear, I'm absolutely in favor of games that encourage you to learn them. I mean, I'm a fucking roguelike fan after all. But I feel like Ninja Gaiden does not reward you for learning as much as it punishes a lack of knowledge. There are sections where you have to plan ahead with knowledge that you can't obtain without at least one attempt, at least if you want to keep moving at a steady pace rather than stutter stepping the whole way. I think it's a ton of fun once you do start to get the hang of it, and optimizing your play as you learn a stage is fun. But the more difficult sections left me feeling like I had to slog my way through the first few doomed attempts before I could have a real chance at making it through. I want to be very clear here, this doesn't kill my enjoyment of the game, but it goes back to what I said earlier. I think that Ninja Gaiden is good, but it could have been so much better. That being said, I do think that this whole design philosophy does actually work well for players who are good at setting internal goals for themselves. So for example, if you're a speedrunner, you want to get through the game with no continues, or you're that fucking madman who just recently managed to do the first ever no damage run of the game, I think that Ninja Gaiden works perfectly in that regard. But for me, I have an entirely different mindset. I play through the games once each specifically for this video, and once I'm done with this video, I'll move on to the next one where I'll play whatever game or games I need to make that happen. I put a lot of my free time into this channel, so I don't really go back and replay games very much anymore because it negatively affects how much I can upload. And with how long these videos take to make, I try to be somewhat efficient when I choose what to play. So while I think that Ninja Gaiden is great for repeat playthroughs, it definitely didn't really gel with the one and done approach I took. And you know what? I wasn't even around when these games were released, so maybe I'm not taking into account the general gaming culture at the time. Hell, I bet if this was the hot new game when I was a kid, I'd have sunk plenty of time into it due to how relatively rare it was for me to get new video games. This is the kind of thing that I can't say is objectively a big problem with the game, but it did negatively impact my enjoyment of it. Okay, let's move on from that. The game is structured by acts, where each act is split up into multiple stages. The game works on a system of what I like to call soft and hard checkpoints. Whenever you get to a new screen, I consider that a soft checkpoint, where you'll respawn at the start of that screen when you die. However, if you get a game over by losing all your lives, continuing will set you back to the very start of the stage, which I consider to be hard checkpoints as they persist through game overs. At the end of each act, you'll fight a boss. One nice thing is that you do get healed up when you enter a boss room. The bosses are a bit hit or miss for me, and I'll just tell you now that I think the bosses in Ninja Gaiden 1 are for the most part the weakest in the entire series. For the most part, the bosses, except for the first act, are very hard and you'll probably have to give them multiple attempts before you understand their attack patterns enough to take them down. The level of bullshit also varies pretty significantly. I mean, you got fat Jason Voorhees here who's as simple as they come. Just slashy slashy, move back a bit, and repeat until dead. Contrast this with the masked devil. These lightning attacks he shoots out are a massive pain in the dick to avoid. Yes, you can do it, but the timing is weird and your window of safety is pretty damn small. It took me multiple attempts at that fight to avoid the attack even once. And it wasn't even a case of just not nailing the execution. For a good while, I wasn't even sure what I needed to do to really avoid this attack with any consistency. To me, that's the most frustrating thing. When I'm faced with a difficult obstacle in a game, I have absolutely zero problem with trying over and over again until I can execute that trick or fight or jump perfectly. When I do multiple attempts and I'm still not sure where I'm even going wrong, it pisses me off. And let me tell you, some of the fights pissed me off, though pretty much all of them became pretty damn fun once I had them figured out. Another thing I have to mention is actually a bug. One of the things you can do is if you're in the air and hit down and attack at the same time, you will immediately do a slash without having to wait for any animation. This can be spammed as much as you want, only limited by how fast you can repeatedly press the buttons. Now this was obviously not intended by the developers, but after messing around with it, I feel like it actually meshes with the gameplay in a really satisfying way. Since it's based on button presses, it feels skill expressive and in a way, you're sacrificing a bit of temporary mobility in order to spam out damage, and I really enjoyed fucking around with the bosses with this bug. Honestly, if you decide to try out Ninja Gaiden, I'd highly recommend using this bug because it's just so much fun. And it's not like the game bosses become easy as a result, it's still hard as hell. Now really quickly, I do want to go over the story of Ninja Gaiden just a bit. I was originally going to kind of walk through the game section by section explaining the story beats as I go, but honestly, I don't think the story is really interesting enough to warrant that. 
As I mentioned earlier, it's basically a cheesy 80s movie. You're not there for quality writing, you're there for the ninja who's killing everyone. The basic plot goes like this. After the intro, Ryu makes his way to America and gets his ass shot. He wakes up and the woman who shot him gives him a statue and tells him to run. He soon finds out that the statue is one of a set of two that together are a prison for the demon Joshin. Fast forward a bit and the CIA kidnap Ryu and tell him to kill this cult guy named Jakio who's trying to release the demon. Fast forward a bit more and he learns that his father is actually still alive but possessed and under the control of the baddies. This brings us to the ending section of the game. As you cross the doorway from 6-3 into the boss room, you have to fight Ryu's father. Well, more accurately you have to destroy the evil thing controlling him as he tries to kill you with all these bullshit projectiles flying everywhere. But let me tell you something. Remember when I was talking about soft and hard checkpoints? Well, having experienced that exact system the entire way through the game up to this point, I figured it wouldn't change now. Safe bet, right? Wrong. Now, I had been essentially trained to expect that a death would send me to the beginning of the previous screen and a game over would send me back to the start of 6-3. But you know what actually happened? I died, did not get a game over, and respawned. At the beginning of 6-1. The beginning of the fucking act. I had to go back all the way through the entirety of Act 6 just to get another chance at the fight. And here's the thing. Once you manage to free Ryu's father, Jakio is understandably pissed so you have to fight him in another tough boss fight. And once you kill him, the demon awakens and you have to fight it. So the very end is basically a gauntlet mode of bosses. Now I think that's pretty cool, but here's the thing. Die to any of them and you get sent back to 6-1. This turned what could have been an incredibly challenging but also incredibly fun final obstacle into a big ol' middle finger. This fucking stupid design decision does not make the game any harder, it just makes it more punishing. It wastes your time making you complete a large swath of content over and over again for no good reason. So I did something I'm not exactly proud of, but I'm certainly not ashamed of. I set a save state at the beginning of the fight so I didn't have to go through the entirety of Act 6 for every single attempt. To be clear, I did still kill the bosses legit, I just didn't feel the need to trudge through the same section that I've already beaten over and over. Now look, these videos take a very long time to make. Hours and hours of active effort go into them under ideal circumstances. If I didn't use a save state, that could have easily added a dozen hours, hell, probably dozens plural, to the time it took me just to beat the first game, and I don't think I could have justified that to myself. Let me put it this way. If save stating there had not been an option, I'd have scrapped the video. The evolution of Ninja Gaiden would not exist. So if any of you retro purists out there are disappointed, I'm sorry. No, wait, what am I talking about? I'm not sorry at all. I circumvented an incredibly poor design decision with modern technology. Don't like it? Get fucked. But that diatribe aside, I found the final section to be a whole lot of fun. With a save state, of course. I'm no stranger to difficulty, and I think gauntlets like this can be a great way to really test your skills, and it also serves as a great final hurdle. Let's be real here. The final boss, or at least the final encounter, should generally speaking be the hardest in pretty much any game, not counting things like hidden bosses or epilogues, of course. But to be completely honest here, none of these last three bosses were noticeably at that final boss level of difficulty individually. There were other bosses that gave me much more trouble. The difficulty came from the fact that you have to fight all three of them in succession, and while they were all certainly challenging in their own right, the fact that they weren't obnoxiously difficult made it so the gauntlet of boss fights wasn't too frustrating, especially as I started to get much more consistent at killing the first two. After killing the demon, the woman who shot Ryu is ordered to kill him and steal the statues for the CIA. She refuses and she and Ryu end up together despite there being like no emotional build up to this moment. I said that the story was a cheesy 80s action movie, right? Well this is basically a case of the token woman shacking up with Mr. Hero protagonist man. It's just kind of how these stories go. Oh yeah, and you also learn that her name is Irene. And as the credits theme plays, which is my favorite track of the entire series by the way, they both live happily ever after. At least until the next game but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Overall, I found Ninja Gaiden to be a lot of fun. I definitely think that some of the design and technical bits didn't age very well, but it was actually a whole lot more polished than I was expecting, and I found myself really getting into it. And of course, the soundtrack was absolutely incredible. One of the best soundtracks on the NES, if you ask me. I can see why this game is considered a classic and why some of my favorite games took inspiration from it. It's far from perfect, but it really laid a solid foundation. Let's see how the series moves on from here. Okay, so the second Ninja Gaiden game is set a year after the first concludes, and there's a new megalomaniac named Ashtar who wants to take over the world and basically enslave humanity. It's not shown on screen, but Ashtar and his goons capture Irene to bait Ryu into coming after them so they can kill him. Now that's one thing I do want to complain about. Again, I get that the story is not the focus here, and it's probably not even really meant to be good, but Irene honestly feels like a completely different character here. Yeah, she was basically a walking trope in the first game, but she was still actually kinda badass. 
She was a smart, capable CIA agent and was actually the only person who was able to physically incapacitate Ryu. But in the second game, Irene is fucking useless. Her entire purpose here is to be the damsel in distress and she's just incapable of doing anything without Ryu having to come to the rescue for the entire game. Now I'm not making some kind of political or social statement here. I honestly don't give a shit about the damsel in distress trope. It's usually a lazy thing to include, but it works as an effective motivator for the protagonist and I'm okay with it. My issue is not that there is a damsel in distress, my issue is that they changed a character so fundamentally that aside from her appearance and name, she might as well not even be Irene. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the focus is much more on the gameplay than the story, so this really didn't take away any enjoyment for me, but I definitely think it could have been done better. Now I realize I started this section off pretty negatively, but now I want to pivot into praise. If you've been watching the channel long enough to have seen my Hand of Fate 2 video, you'll know my stance on sequels. Essentially, I believe that a good sequel should innovate on the original, fix core issues with the original, but preserve the spark that made people fall in love with the original in the first place. And let me tell you, Ninja Gaiden 2 does a lot of that. It's not perfect, and there are still things I dislike about it, but despite being made with the same technical limitations, it's just a more fun game to play in my opinion. The movement feels a lot more responsive. It doesn't show super well on video, but it feels easier to do precision jumps, at least moving forward. When you cling onto a wall, you can actually climb up and down now, which is an absolute godsend. The slashing animation is just a little faster, making it easier to actually hit enemies. There were just so many little things that got added that I feel overall improved my experience with the game. They also removed the bug where you could spam your attack in the air, which is kinda disappointing, but fair enough. One big change I noticed almost immediately was that there was a lot more enemy variety and different things the enemies could do. In the first game, most of what you'd see are variations on a simple path the enemies would follow, enemies who shoot in a straight line, or enemies who would just blindly chase you down. Here I saw a lot of different things. There were these scorpion dudes who would roll when they get close to you. There were more enemies who would actually target you with their projectiles. A lot of enemies were able to navigate the platforming sections on their own, so just jumping to a different platform isn't a guarantee of safety like it often was in the first game. There were enemies that clung to the wall and sometimes even jumped between two walls. Of course, you still had simple enemies, but I feel like having this increased level of stuff to deal with allows Ninja Gaiden 2 to feel like a great way to follow up the first game, especially if you're coming straight off the first game. It feels like you can utilize the knowledge and skill you've already developed while still having new things to deal with, and I really like that. Plus, the fact that these things were different helped keep the game from getting stale. It wasn't just more of the first game, which may well have caused me to burn out a bit. I liked how in terms of the enemies themselves, it felt like an entirely new set of challenges to overcome. The level design was a bit different as well. It still retained the same basic premise of get to the end without dying, and there's still a big emphasis on enemy placement and dealing with multiple obstacles. But I noticed that Ninja Gaiden 2 plays around with verticality a lot more. Where the first game didn't really treat height as much more than a novelty, the second actively used that concept to make you think about the challenges that lie ahead. If one of those fucking birds spawns when you're up towards the top of the screen, you have to react a bit differently than if you're down towards the bottom. You have to consider the implications of different enemies spawning on different platforms. Sometimes you'll have a choice of going high or going low, which affects how you'll take on the next obstacle. And this also leads to slightly more complex platforming in general, which is something I appreciate. The pure platforming never gets ludicrously difficult, but the first game was downright simple. As I've said a couple of times now, the difficulty in the platforming largely comes from the enemies, but throwing in a bit of complexity, not a lot, but a bit, just gives the gameplay that much more depth. And it does it in a way that doesn't require you to memorize more things. You just have to apply what you already know about the movement and enemy patterns to new contexts and figure out how it all interacts with the stage itself. This is something I personally like in my games. It just scratches a particular itch when a game can squeeze out complexity from simple ideas. It's one of the reasons I love Celeste so much. There's brutal difficulty and you have to approach each stage differently, but the controls all boil down to just four commands. Run, jump, climb, and dash. Now I don't think Ninja Gaiden 2 does this quite as well as Celeste, but it's clear that care went into making each level unique and varied by utilizing what we already know instead of just throwing in new crap left and right. Another thing that this game does is it plays around a bit with environmental effects. There are a couple of stages where movement is affected by the stage itself. There's wind that'll constantly exert a force either forward or backward. This can make you move slower or give you a bit of a boost. There's a stage where there's water flowing on the ground, affecting you with same as wind, but only when you're touching the ground. There's even a stage that has ice physics. It's all very rudimentary, but it shows that the developers didn't want to just coast on the success of the first game and actually had things they wanted to achieve creatively. And remember, this game was released back in 1990, long before these kinds of effects were as ubiquitous in platformers as they are today. Another thing I think deserves a brief mention is power-ups. These don't radically change from game to game, though they do go through a few tweaks here and there. But they did add a really neat power-up in Ninja Gaiden 2, one that stands out even against the 30 years worth of video games that came after it. I've seen it called a few different names, so I'll just use the one I like best. 
Shadow Clones When you collect a Shadow Clone pickup, you'll spawn an orange clone behind you that mirrors your movement, but with a bit of a delay. When you move, it moves. When you stop, it stops until you move again. And when you attack with your sword or secondary weapon, the clone will do the same. This is a really neat system, and on some of the bosses, I found myself utilizing the clone to great effect. I was able to, at times, set up a trap of sorts for the flying bosses and have the clone slash at them. This let me get an easy damage since I don't have to worry about the clone taking damage. It gave me another way to approach things, and that's always something I like. Okay, now let's talk about the bosses. This is completely subjective here, but I definitely prefer the bosses in Ninja Gaiden 2 to the original. While still very difficult, I found the attack patterns a whole lot easier to internalize. There was just a whole lot less of the bullshit attacks that you'd sometimes see in the first game. Even when a boss was extremely frustrating, the difficulty was in the execution itself rather than in figuring out what the hell it was even doing. All the bosses made sense to me, and it was just a matter of not fucking up. That being said, there was a design decision made in regards to these boss fights that I really do not like. In the first game, you got healed to full every time you enter a boss room so that you can fight the boss on equal footing. In this game, and 3 for that matter, you don't. You have to take on that boss with whatever health you entered with. I strongly dislike this. As I already mentioned, the bosses are hard, and when they hit you, they take off a big chunk of health. There's already not much room for error, and even if I was healed to full, it would still take a while to actually kill most of the bosses. With this system, I found that it really discouraged me from pushing through when I would screw up in the stage prior to the boss. In the first game, I might take stupid damage leading up to the boss, but I knew that if I was able to clutch it out, I could still have a fair shake in the boss fight. In this game, if I take too much damage and get low early on in the stage, I don't feel like it's even worth pressing on, and instead I would often just jump off a ledge and reset. I like when games encourage you to adapt to your mistakes, and with this decision to not heal you for the boss, I feel like Ninja Gaiden 2 was actively working against that end, and I honestly think it's poor game design. And it's even worse at the very end. Like the first game, the final section pits you against three bosses in a gauntlet. Like the first game, it's a lot of fun, but you don't fucking get healed. You have to kill these three bosses in a row on a single health bar. You just have to hope you've learned the bosses well enough to smash through them near perfectly. That being said, I found the second and third of these bosses to be surprisingly easy, all things considered, and I have to wonder if that was a deliberate decision to account for the lack of healing. The first of the gauntlet was the one that gave me the most trouble, whereas the second and third all had very simple and predictable attack patterns that were very easy to develop muscle memory for. Once I was able to consistently beat the first, completing the whole gauntlet went surprisingly quickly. Oh yeah, story is a thing. It kinda sucked, so let's just quickly run through it. Ryu spends most of the game chasing down Ashtar. After catching up to him, Ashtar gets a cheap shot in, but US Army guy Robert saves him. Ryu chases Ashtar down again, at which point Ashtar stabs Irene and Ryu kills him. Of course, now he has to clean up the evil supernatural shit that Ashtar stirred up, so he leaves Irene with Robert and goes to destroy the evil altar. So then he makes his way through and finds none other than Jakio, the baddie from the original, who basically pulled an Uno reverse card and was reborn. He also has Irene. Yeah, I told you she was useless in this game. Literally only exists to get kidnapped. Ryu kills Jakio again, and then that big evil demon that got sealed away in the first game comes the fuck back, so Ryu has to fight him again again and seals them away. And they all live happily ever after. Until the next game. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So just like the last game, the story is kinda cringe, but it's whatever since that's not why you should play the game. Overall, I found Ninja Gaiden 2 to be a substantial improvement over the first in almost every way. They polished out some of the issues I had, added new and exciting things for me to play around with, and it came with a satisfying degree of fair challenge. Of course, I still do strongly dislike that you no longer heal before boss fights, but it's not something that killed my enjoyment of the game. All in all, this was a fun time, and I'm kinda surprised that it's the first game that gets all the love and praise when the sequel was, in my opinion, straight up better. Another game, another melodramatic title. So in the last section, I said that Ryu and Irene lived happily ever after until the next game. Well, I did kind of bend the truth a bit for the sake of a humorous callback. Ninja Gaiden 3, despite having the number 3 in the title, actually takes place chronologically between the first and second games. Now, you'd be forgiven for not knowing that. In fact, I myself had no fucking idea it happened before the second game until I was doing some additional research for this video after beating the game. It's possible that I could have just missed something in game, but even looking over my footage again, if it's there, it's certainly not very obvious. Anyway, that doesn't matter. The intro to this game shows Ryu chasing down Irene, who ends up falling off a cliff into the ocean. And as we all know, when a character falls into the ocean, that means they're definitely really truly dead, right? Man, I'm really good at foreshadowing, aren't I? Well, it turns out it wasn't actually Ryu who murderized Irene. It was an imposter. A little sus if you ask me, but investigating the situation works as a motivator for Ryu. In fact, I actually like this setup more than the other two games. I find it less cringy and more down to earth. 
I honestly didn't feel like the series really executed its over-the-top storytelling very well, so this was a nice change of pace. Of course, things do escalate later on. A lot. I mean, come on, the game is called Ancient Ship of Doom. But credit where credit is due. I liked how it starts. I'll get to the rest of the story later on. So when I first started playing the game, I was shocked. Everything about it felt like it was completely rebuilt from the ground up on a mechanical level. Movement was more fluid and jumping was more floaty. Jumping backwards was much easier to control. Not quite at the level I would like, but still a massive improvement. The knockback from getting hit was greatly reduced, as with the amount of time you'd be stunned. When climbing to the top of a wall, you could do a jump up and over onto the platform directly. Yes, it was a little clunky, but still better than before where you'd have to either use another wall or platform or do this weird mid-air stutter to achieve the same result. They even added a new mechanic where some platforms let you hang along the bottom and move around like monkey bars. It felt like the developers really wanted to innovate once again when they could very easily have just rested on their laurels and made more of the same, which I'm sure would have still performed well. But no, they redid even basic movement, and in my opinion, this is the most responsive of the series and it controls very well, even compared to the previous two games, which, as I mentioned, controlled very well for their time. They also added some nice touches to the power-ups. They added a couple of new ones, nothing too crazy, but it filled out some stuff that was missing. For example, in addition to the existing upward diagonal flames, there's a downward diagonal flame power-up. There's also one that attacks directly above and below. But the one thing I really like about the power-ups in this game is something that actually falls under quality of life. The floating orbs that drop pickups actually show you what's in them before you slice them. Holy crap, this is something that was desperately needed. No more rote memorization of what pickup is where. Now you can actually plan your course of action ahead of time. I love it, and it shows that they were really able to look at their work, see what needed improvement, and act upon it. Like before, it's not perfect, and I'm not trying to claim that it is, but a lot of the flaws I see are more products of its time than anything else. For a game released in the early 90s, I'm very impressed. The level design follows a similar trend as the second game, but it kicks it up a notch with some fairly complex platforming, at least for its time. You see a decent amount of moving platforms, many of which you can hang from. Environmental attacks are pretty common, with them even including a quicksand effect that has you slowly sink until you jump, meaning you'll basically be hopping around in order to get anywhere. Not my favorite, to be honest, but it's interesting. Definitely a good amount of verticality going on, with there even being an auto-scrolling section where you have to climb up and escape the lava that's rising with you. This is somewhat of a gameplay trope nowadays, but it was pretty novel for Ninja Gaiden. And there were even sections where they let the platforming itself provide the challenge rather than just relying on enemies to fill out that difficulty. Of course, enemy placement was still the main factor, but you'd have sections where you'd have to dodge obstacles on moving platforms, time your movement to avoid retracting spikes, things like that. It's a huge step forward, and again, I'm impressed. When I went into this project, I was honestly expecting the three games to be nearly carbon copies of each other, with only minor changes throughout. Instead, I got to see genuine innovation and improvement with each installment, and I love it. There's another thing that kind of surprised me. Ninja Gaiden is known for its brutal difficulty. That's just the legacy it's developed, and it's something I can personally attest to. But goddamn, I was not prepared for how much harder Ninja Gaiden 3 is compared to the first two. Starting at Act 2, the difficulty spikes up massively, and I found myself taking a lot longer to get through individual sections of this game compared to the first two. I have a suspicion that the developers made this game specifically to appeal to fans of the first two. I can't think of any other reason for them to deliberately make the game even harder than the already challenging first two games. I'm not saying this is a good or bad thing either. I personally like hard games. I like having a challenge to overcome, and I honestly feel very accomplished after having beaten this series of games, so I'm not complaining. That being said, this increased level of difficulty had an anti-synergistic effect with a new design decision, one that I think is very dated. See, the first time I got a game over, I noticed something. After that game over, the number 5 appeared on my screen. After jumping off a few ledges for a while as an experiment, I came to realize that it was exactly as I feared. A fucking limited continue system. You get 5 continues for the whole game, after which it boots you back to the main menu. And the weirdest thing to me is that after doing a bit of research, this was something they added in to the US release of the game. The Japanese version had unlimited continues just like the first two. Also, apparently the US version is also just straight up harder than the Japanese version. Why? Fuck if I know. I really do not like limited continue systems because just like the issue I had with the first game sending you back to the beginning of the act if you died to the final boss, I feel like it doesn't make the game more challenging, only more punishing. If you're having trouble with a section a decent way into the game, all this mechanic does is waste your time having you slog through sections you've already proven you can beat. Now fortunately, there's actually a cheat code you can do in the main menu that'll give you 99 continues and you bet your ass I used it. Again, these videos take a very long time as is, so I wasn't going to make it take longer by having to restart the entire fucking game 
game from time to time. I still cleared the entire game, I didn't make it any easier, I just made it so I could keep on progressing without having to risk a complete wipe. And honestly, I feel like I enjoyed myself more than if I was constantly worried about losing all my progress. Again, going back to Celeste, which is one of my favorite games, one of the main things I loved about that game was that there were these brutally difficult stages and I could just keep charging at them until I emerged victorious, never having to worry about losing progress. But it's whatever. I'll just accept this as a product of its time. It's not the only game to have limited continues, and besides, the fact that there's a 99 continues cheat means that you can basically ignore the mechanic even if you're playing on original hardware. The bosses are, in my subjective opinion, the best in the series, at least for the most part. They're also the easiest in the series, which is kinda weird when you consider how hard the rest of the game is. I mean, for example, I went into the Act 5 boss on low health, yeah, you don't recover health before a boss fight here either, and I still managed to beat it on the first try. This was the only boss in the entire series, with the exception of Act 1 bosses, that I was able to kill on the first try. It honestly baffles me. The bosses are otherwise fairly challenging, though I maintain that they aren't as challenging as the first two games. I do think their design is very easy to understand, and much like the second game, the difficulty came in the execution itself as opposed to what the fuck am I supposed to do here. And the gauntlet sequence, are you surprised that it ends in a boss gauntlet, is interesting. You start out fighting the hardest boss of the game in my opinion, that flies around and tosses these flaming orbs that move in a very weird pattern and loosely hone in on you, and it took some getting used to. He also zaps you with lightning whenever he's hit, which is fun. Then it moves on to a surprisingly easy boss that literally only has two attacks that are incredibly easy to avoid once you figure it out. And then the final boss, which I actually really enjoyed. It had a few standard attacks, but it moved around and you have to dodge an attack based on how it was moving and how that would impact the location of its various attacks. Like the laser that fires into the ground and bounces upward, or the wall of flame that you have to jump over. My biggest complaint here is once again the lack of healing prior to each fight. This is especially frustrating during the first few attempts at each boss because chances are you'll be going in with low health health and you won't even be able to effectively feel out the boss's attacks. You'll just get smacked and die immediately. Again, not healing is annoying enough in a standard stage. It pisses me off in the gauntlet because it turned what could have otherwise been an absolutely amazing and challenging boss experience into a tedious and frustrating one. And that's a shame because I really did have a good time in the fights, at least in isolation. These bosses are pretty damn good for their time and I feel like a few poor design decisions really dragged the game down. This is something I mention fairly often in my videos, but I tend to get more angry when a game is just barely held back from being absolutely stellar than I am when a game is out right bad. And that's how I feel with the bosses here. They are just so much fun, but their potential is completely neutered when there was no reason for it. Oh well, no point in continuing to bitch about it. Oh yeah, there was a story. Okay, quickie overview. After being framed for Irene's death, Ryu meets a mysterious figure who tells him to go to a place called Castle Rock Fortress. On the way, he meets a CIA dude named Foster and eventually his doppelganger, who gives that whole I'm you, but better type of speech that's a bit tropey by today's standards. Doppel Ryu spares Ryu because he was ordered not to kill him yet, which as you know always works out in the villain's favor. Ryu then makes it to Castle Rock and meets up with the mysterious figure and his name is fucking Clancy. That is probably the least intimidating name I can think of. Oh, and Irene is alive, which I'm sure absolutely nobody saw coming. And besides, if you go in knowing that this game is set between the first two, you'll know full well that Irene is alive because she's in the second game. Well, to make things as simple as they're gonna get, the demonic shit Ryu was up to in the first game opened an interdimensional rift and Clancy and Foster were using the resulting life energy to create bionoids, which are essentially superhuman mutants. Doppel Ryu mutates, Ryu beats it, and the rift opens even more and Clancy runs through. Foster tries to run but gets zapped by the portal energy, I guess. Ryu catches up to Doppel Ryu and finally kills it. Clancy apparently wants to wipe out humanity and start over. Oh yeah, and it turns out the portal leads to a warship, the titular Ancient Ship of Doom. Clancy gives that whole, join me and we can rule together speech. Obviously, Ryu tells him to fuck off, and after a few more trials and tribulations, he kills Clancy and destroys the ship. So he and Irene watch it go down and they live happily ever after. Until the next- Nah, I'm just kidding. Now I know I'm being very dismissive of the story of the entire series despite the fact that if you watch my videos you know that I'm usually really into story stuff. Shit, my last video was basically me discussing writing theory for 40 minutes because that shit really gets me going. But the thing is, there's not really much substance to the story of Ninja Gaiden. The plot is wacky and over the top, but it acts more like a set piece than an actual narrative. The characters themselves, while I like their design and I think they have potential, are basically just… there. They have no real personality, no character growth, and there was almost no attention given to developing chemistry between them which robbed several scenes of the emotion they were clearly going for. I mean, even after three games, I absolutely cannot see why Irene and Ryu are together. I really do not buy the love between them. 
The story, I feel, lands on this really unfortunate middle ground where it's not good enough to be enjoyable on its merits, but also, despite being very over the top, it's not quite campy enough to fall into so bad it's good territory. So as a result, it's just kind of there and kind of boring. And as I've repeated ad nauseum in this video, that doesn't take away from the fun of the game itself as the story is not the focus. But I think that a bit more care could have elevated these games even further. Then again, this was the late 80s and early 90s before anyone had really taken notice of video games as a legitimate artistic medium, so it's not like I could really expect something beyond surface level. I mean, that's pretty much all there was at the time. Again, I'm not going to hold it against the developers too much, but I do find it somewhat disappointing. So overall, Ninja Gaiden 3 really impressed me and I'm surprised at how much care went into it. They improved on an already working formula to an incredible degree. I think it has the best level design, the best controls, and the best bosses of the series. Though it certainly wasn't perfect and the limited continues especially annoyed me. Still, nonetheless, this is my favorite game of the series. So that was Ninja Gaiden, a classic 2D platformer who alongside Mario basically paved the path for the two main styles of 2D platformer that we'd see for decades to come. For a series that started out on already strong footing, had a very short development cycle for each of its two sequels, and was worked on by a very small team, the series managed to consistently grow, improve, and of course, evolve. And what I find even more impressive is that these improvements happened without any technological advancements. These three games, while they did eventually get ports to systems like the SNES, were all developed for the same system, the NES. It wasn't a case of developers utilizing new tools to make a better game, it was a case of the developers refining their work with the same set of tools with barely any time to do it. Even though I have my complaints and I do question some of the design decisions, I have to give major props to the guys over at Tecmo. Even though Ninja Gaiden is considered a classic, I don't think they get the recognition and appreciation they deserve. I would definitely recommend playing these games. Even for a modern gamer, I think they're worthwhile. I'm certainly glad that I could personally experience the evolution of Ninja Gaiden. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. These videos take a really long time to make and I have to work around my full time job so your support is greatly appreciated. Also let me know what game series you think deserves the evolution treatment. I can't promise I'll do it, but I can promise to at least consider it. Follow me on Twitter at AdsTweets for updates and memes and join my Discord server if you want to hang out and chat. Once again, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Play the Electro Swing.